Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video, tackling one of our top 10 lists. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any future videos. Today's topic, 10 ways to grow in faith. We know faith is essential for the child of God because without faith, it is impossible to please him. Hebrews 11.6 It is by grace we are saved through faith, and just as surely the just shall live by faith. So it sounds like an essential part of daily living for the believer. So what are some ways to practically advance in the journey of faith? Let's take a look. Our number one way to grow in faith, learn more of God and His amazing ways. You often hear people say, have faith keep the faith, and so on. But the Bible always roots it in the object of faith and says, have faith in God. It's the object of faith that makes the difference. You can have truckloads of faith in a false religion. It doesn't do you an inch of good. But a mustard seed worth of faith placed in God makes all the difference. So we understand that the greater your God the greater your faith. As we come to know God in a greater and richer way, our faith grows based on what we consider God to be. Wow, that is essential. Our second way is to ask for it. It seems so simple and so obvious, but that's exactly what the scripture says. But let him ask in faith. Lord, increase our faith. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. These are all expressions of the idea that God is able to massage and stimulate and feed my faith. So when we do that, of course, we can expect some faith-stretching experiences in life. God is going to exercise our faith so that it grows. Number three, Make a practice of acting on what God shows you in His Word. This is based on Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So when I read something in the Bible, I may accept it as an opinion. But when, by faith, I put it into practice, it becomes a conviction. I don't think it's true. I know it's true. It's a bit like those books the children had where there was a little probe that came with it. And if they put their probe into the right spot, the light came on. And that's what happens when we see something in the Word of God and by faith we exercise ourselves, we obey what that says, and all of a sudden it passes from conjecture to convincing proof. And so my faith grows in what God has said. I trust God's word. And going hand in hand with that is number four, yield to the spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. Everybody knows that passage describes the characteristics of the fruit of the spirit. And one of them is faith or faithfulness. And so obviously if it's fruit, it grows. It's not stagnant. Somebody says, I don't have much faith. Well, as we yield to the Holy Spirit of God and the Spirit leads us in the direction of obedience to God's Word, of course the Spirit of God will help cultivate this attitude of faith and faithfulness, that is taking God seriously, consistently in my life. Our fifth way to grow is to learn from your spiritual guides. Thankfully, I'm not alone in this. There are people around me, people I know, people who led me to Christ, people who teach me the Word of God. And Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember those who have spoken the Word of God to you, whose faith follow considering the outcome of their conduct. I don't follow people in their foibles or their failures. 
In other words, you wouldn't follow Moses the way he got along with his wife or the way David raised his children. Uh, but we can follow them in the measure of their faith. None of these people were perfect in themselves, but there was that longing after God, that appetite for God that lays out for us a path of faith. So would you have included Samson or Jephthah in the great faith chapter? God does. Because though there were areas of failure, there were also areas of faithfulness. And so when we look at people, we can easily pick out their flaws, but it's better to follow their faith. Follow them in the areas in which they're faithful. Say, look, I know where you're going. I know what you're after. I know what you want in your life. And I want the same thing. So in the measure in which you're faithful, I'm going to follow you. And our next one plays off a similar idea. Read good missionary biographies. We have about 300 missionary biographies sitting in the room here with us. And the college students, many of them like to take them and read them. They are very instructive and they're very encouraging. Now, there are good biographies and not so good ones. They say that self-portraits are usually colored. Sometimes that's not always the case. Sometimes there's someone who is almost worshipful of the person they're writing about and they tend to exaggerate things a bit. So we don't want to be discouraged by missionary biographies, thinking these people walked on water. These people had the same kinds of problems that we have, but just the same, there are tremendous lessons these people learned in the crucible of life, in the tough situations of life. They learned to trust God. And we have great books on George Mueller and Hudson Taylor and many others that are invaluable in seeing faith in the fire, faith in the, in the tough times of life, and how God proves him faithful. If you put your faith in God, God will prove himself faithful. And so that's the idea, according to your faith, be it unto you. If there's some area of life you don't trust God in, he'll love you anyway. But if you do trust him, he'll prove himself faithful and he'll grow your faith. And that one moves us right into number seven, venture out in faith. I like the example of the unnamed servant, probably Eliezer, a servant of Abraham who was sent to get a bride for Isaac. And he says, I being in the way, the Lord led me. So it's good to put yourself in the way, that is in the way of the purposes of God. There are people who never venture out on anything. Uh, they, they daydream their life away. God doesn't answer daydreams. He answers prayers. God doesn't reward wild hopes and expectations. He rewards diligence and faithfulness. And as we seek out God's way, as it were, get in the way of God's purposes, we'll come home with stories like this man did where he saw God work in a remarkable way, providing the perfect woman for Isaac to be a bride. And that only happens when we're, so to speak, in the way. Number eight, raise your Ebenezers and remember God's past faithfulness. Now, what does that mean? Well, Ebenezer means hitherto the Lord has helped us. That is, it was a practice of the patriarchs that when God had done something great in their lives, they would build a little pile of stones, a cairn, a marker, so they wouldn't forget. And the Lord was always ready to do this. Even in the middle of the conquest of Canaan, he gathers the people together up at Mount Ebal and Gerizim, and he reminds them of his faithfulness Remember how I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Remember how I opened up the Red Sea. And it's good for us not to forget past faithfulnesses of the Lord. And we have a classic example here in Hebrews chapter 11. Abraham, we read, was strong in faith. Sarah, we don't read that of Sarah. But here's what we read. By faith, this is verse 11. By faith, Sarah herself 
also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Now, Abraham was able to believe what he didn't see. He was able to look forward and take God for this astronomical promise that not only was he going to be the father of a son, but I have made you the father of many nations. God said, look at all the stars. That's what your family is going to be like. And Abraham believed God. Sarah struggled at that. She couldn't believe. Looking forward was hard for her. But as they say, hindsight is 2020. And so she looked back to the past faithfulnesses of God and she judged him faithful who had promised. She said, I've seen in the past how God has cared for me. And on that basis, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to trust him for the future, even though I can't see it like my husband can. But on the basis of his past faithfulness, I'm good to go. So that's really key. That's, that is an encouraging way to stand and say, well, wait a minute. In that case, in that case, don't forget all the times that God's been faithful to you. The fact of the matter is, as I look into this camera, every believer is a living, walking miracle. Right? Every one of us has already had the greatest miracle occur that could ever occur when we were born again. And so anything from here on is, I wouldn't say it's small potatoes, but it's considerably less than what happened when I went from death to life. So on the basis of God saving me, if I can trust him for my eternity, surely I can trust him for groceries. I can trust him for my daily needs. Number nine is to learn practical steps from those with the gift of faith. This is one of those specific gifts mentioned, the gift of faith. And I think the idea of the gift of faith is that God gives certain people the ability to believe an awful lot so that the rest of us are inspired to at least believe in a little. If George Mueller can trust God for 2,000 orphans, maybe we can trust him for two. And so we're inspired by that. And if you look at a man like George Mueller, you'll see that when he talks about trusting God, he says, look, be specific in prayer and be childlike in your prayer. Keep right on praying. Don't give up. He spoke about a group of young men that he began to pray for in his early Christian life and how he had prayed for them through 50, 60, 70 years before he saw them all saved. One of the things he suggested was, if there's something lying ahead of you and you don't know whether it's the will of God or not, pray a mountain in the way. In other words, ask God to make it an impossibility unless he does it. And he said, you know, once that happened, I could determine my own motives pretty quickly. If I was scrambling and trying to dig it out of the way with my hands, if I was trying to do things myself, I knew it was my will and not his will. But if I could stand back and say, Lord, in your will, in your purpose, you can move this mountain, and if you do, I'll move ahead, then he had the confidence it was the will of God. So people like George Mueller, he has books that have been written on answers to prayer. Sister Abigail, does God answer prayer? Sister Abigail says yes. These are marvelous books, and they greatly inspire us to faith in God. And our final one at number 10, practice good works since they are the evidence of faith. James chapter 2 tells us that faith and works are two sides of the same coin. And if we have true faith, it will manifest itself in works. Not that works saves us, but that work is the public manifestation of my inward faith. The Apostle Paul puts it a slightly different way when he says, this is the only thing that matters, faith that works by love. So faith is invisible to people around me, but love isn't. Love is an action that manifests itself. People will know I have faith in God by the way I love. So practical, loving work 
is an outward display of inward faith. And when I seek to do these works, I need God to provide for me. I need God to maneuver circumstances and to send provision. When he does that, my faith grows. So I venture out on God and I find out that God is faithful. And I think that's really key. Ladies and gentlemen, the most important thing about this idea of faith is that faith is not in faith. We don't have faith in faith. We have faith in God. And what we're learning through faith is to trust God. We're learning faith reveals to us how wonderful our God really is. So as we grow in faith, we are growing in our appreciation for the wonders of our God.